Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for joining. We're going to get started here to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, and as people log in, they can, they can join as we get going. So we appreciate everybody's time today. My name is Sean Lee, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Amify. And thank you for joining us for our session today. We're excited to talk to you about really, should you sell to Amazon, Vendor Central and 1P, or should you sell on Amazon through Seller Central or 3P, really to set yourself up for future growth and as we think about e-commerce over the next decade. Our agenda today is pretty simple. We'll do some quick panelist introductions. I'll be your moderator and introduce the other panelists. And then we'll talk through the big picture of why Amazon matters even more coming out of the post-pandemic era. And then we're gonna go through the pros and cons of each of the three go-to-market models on Amazon that many of you may be familiar with or your business might even be in one of those models today. Then look at a P&L comparison of those models and deep dive into the benefits of what we think is the future, which is a seller central model and talk about which brands it makes sense for to sell that way. And we'll hold some time at the end for a question and answer. So I ask if you have a question, type it into the question and answer bar in the webinar of the Zoom info or of the Zoom meeting and I'll compile them and ask the questions of the panelists at the end. So with that, I think I did a quick introduction, but my name's Sean Lee, I'm the Vice President of Marketing. Um, my background's on the brand side of things. I was a former brand manager at Procter & Gamble, was there for about 10 years and led big brands like IMS, Pet Food, Old Spice Deodorants, and then launched a digitally native brand for them and co-founded it called Zebo Insect. Um, and since then, I've worked as an e-commerce executive for private equity-backed companies and um, now excited to work with Amify to help brands from the director to C-suite level think through their strategy and go to market and grow their Amazon channel for the future. With that, I'll turn it over to Ethan McAfee, our CEO. Yeah, great. Hey, thanks, Sean. Yeah, so this is Ethan McAfee. I'm the founder and CEO of Amify. Um, you know, I started my career um, as an investment analyst covering the internet stocks during the dot-com bubble and um, really saw the internet uh, transform retail um, between kind of 1998 and 2010 eventually decided instead of investing in internet companies, I wanted to start my own, mostly because I was seeing how Amazon was changing the way retail worked. Um, that's when we started Amify and have grown it over the last 10 years. Dan? Hi, everybody. Dan Hasselbauer here, Director of Strategy at Amify. Um, my background is in uh, retail, specifically um, sporting goods mostly, and then also on the wholesale side of the industry as a manufacturer sales rep and uh, territory manager. Um, I've seen firsthand as well over the years how uh, e-commerce has transformed those industries. And I work primarily with brands as we onboard them and set them up, developing their strategies for long-term success and then working uh, with them throughout their relationships. Perfect. Thank you, guys. So I'd be remiss if I didn't do a little plug for Amify before we get going into the discussion. So some quick background on us is Ethan said, we've been around for 10 years and simply put, we help brands win on Amazon. So our company is positioned in the marketplace as a full service strategy management and operational partner. Um, and we help brands grow and increase profitability through our technology and scale. Um, the way we like to frame it up is we're kind of your outsourced Amazon team. We'll do everything from help you think through the, the executive level strategy to actually doing the day-to-day -day work it takes to run a successful Amazon account to grow it. And we've partnered with hundreds of brands on Amazon over the years um, in a variety of categories from clothing to beauty care to industrials to shoes to food. So we have a lot of insights across a variety of categories that we're able to draw upon as we're we're kind of looking and helping brands make decisions. And just some final stats about us. We've done over 100 million in sales on the platform in the past 10 years. We have two warehouses, one in Cincinnati, one in Las Vegas, and we're the only venture capital backed full service provider in the space. And is our badge of honor, we've been on the Inc. 500 fastest growing company list for four separate times. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ethan to talk about why Amazon matters even more um, coming out of the post-pandemic era, as if it did, I mean, it already mattered a ton before that, but even more. Perfect. Hey, thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, if you go to the next slide, that'd be great. So uh, you, we wanted to walk everyone through, and I'm going to spend my time just kind of giving some big picture overview of uh, what's going on with Amazon, why it matters, and, and what, how COVID's really impacting it, and then we'll let the rest of the team kind of dig in. Uh, 
but we think Amazon matters because it's uh, roughly 50% of online e-commerce right now. And when you look at it compared to eBay and some of these other players, you know, it's 12 times the size of Walmart. And so if you're a brand thinking about um, what you should be focusing on, um, it's best to have a really good strategy on Amazon, much more so than spending and diverting your focus and attention on all these other um, marketplaces out there. And so that's what we focus on Amazon, 50% of online sales, um, 12 times bigger than Walmart. Um, again, uh, every, every company's uh, money and time is a scarce commodity. Um, and so let's focus on making Amazon 1% better than launching on Macy's.com or something like that. Um, so if you go to the next slide, that'd be great too. Uh, just a couple other statistics that I think are just, you know, uh, astounding. 68, 69% of households in the United States have Prime membership. Um, and many, you know, the vast majority of um, price searches start on Amazon as well. So uh, next slide. So with COVID and everything going on, I wanted to give two or three slides, just kind of some background to give a big picture overview. So um, this slide on the left shows what percent of total retail is being sold online. And so the statistics, you know, give or take, depending on the category, you're, you're talking only 10 to 20% of online retail, or sorry, of total retail is still being bought online. And that means 80% to 90% are being bought in physical stores. Uh, now, obviously that's been shifting over time, but we think that uh, with obviously right now, especially with most of the physical stores being closed because of COVID, you know, the percentage of online purchases going online, or sorry, the percentage of total purchases going online is gonna go up a huge amount more. Um, if you can go back up. Um, and the second thing to be thinking about is uh, the, the number of store closures around the United States. You know, we've been talking about this re retail apocalypse um, for the last five or 10 years where the internet is forced, forcing brick and mortar retailers to close. Uh, you know, historically this number has kind of been 2,000 to 4,000 stores, uh, physical uh, brick and mortar retailer stores a year. Uh, but now um, there's almost, over 600,000 stores closed um, across the country. And many, many of these will not ever reopen and it will push more and more um, business online. Uh, and since Amazon is the largest uh, online um, uh, player, the vast majority of it will come uh, Amazon. So it just makes your Amazon strategy much more important. Uh, next slide. A couple other statistics that we just find fascinating. Uh, well, the first, I think, statistic that it shows on the left-hand side is up until um, recently, close to 40% um, close to of American shoppers had never actually purchased online, uh, which is an astounding number. But in the last month, because of COVID, 9% uh, of the US population, 22, member, 22 million Americans bought online for the first time. Uh, and the vast majority of people are saying that they're gonna buy even more online going forward. Um, 40, um, sorry, 37% of people claim they're gonna buy more online because of COVID than before. Um, so these are all just really big trends pushing and saying that, hey, uh, the internet is the future, it still has a long way to grow, a long way to grow, and that uh, most brands really need to be thinking about it. And it's kind of probably right now one of the big bright spots um, and one, one area that's growing when Unfortunately, most of the economy is really struggling. Uh, next slide, Sean. Um, so um, kind of transitioning a little bit, most of this presentation is gonna be about uh, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, 1P versus 3P. Um, but when we talk about that, I kind of wanted to give, you know, kind of a backstory a little bit, what, what we think and what we see is going on in the marketplace. And so, um, you know, originally 20 years ago, when you went to Amazon, you could only buy products directly from Amazon. Uh, and then Amazon opened up what was called the marketplace or the 3P marketplace roughly 20 years ago. And that allowed third party sellers to sell their own products on Amazon. And what that really did was allow this marketplace function to start um, be put to use. And over the last 20 years, every single year, uh, the amount of um, total sales that are going uh, on the 3P um, uh, marketplace has increased. And so we've gone from roughly 3% of market share to 60% market share for 3P over the last 20 years. And it's a trend that even Amazon, I think, um, admits will continue. And I think if you take a step back, why this is happening, uh, I think the real reason here is that at the end of the day, Amazon wants to be a marketplace rather than a retailer for most products. Um, you know, being a retailer of a product means you have to hire people to do purchasing and inventory and warehousing, and you have to own inventory, and you have to negotiate, you have to do all these things. Uh, it's complicated. Um, it's not exactly scalable for Amazon and it's, uh, uh, you know, inventory intensive. 
And so what we've been saying is that what we think is Amazon at the end of the day, we'd rather just be a marketplace where people can buy and sell products. Amazon gets its cut, uh, revenue cut of it, uh, and they make money that way. They don't have to own inventory. It's simple and easy. And that's why we think Amazon is one, allowing uh, 3P to really kind of dominate and grow so much faster. Um, and we've also seen a lot of stuff of Amazon uh, reducing the number of 1P vendors that they're working with. And um, many people have read articles over the last six months about something called the Amazon Purge, um, which is Amazon's plans to um, really only be doing 1P for large, uh, you know, kind of $10 million plus Amazon vendors. And so that's something to consider and just as a good statistic when we walk through all these different things. Uh, next slide, Sean. Okay, so um, when we think of Amazon and the business models, there's really three business models brands can use when they sell on Amazon. And if you go to the next slide, um, this, kind of, this slide kind of walks through them. And I think if we take a bigger step back, what we've seen is uh, if you think about the history of retail, uh, you know, retail has been around for hundreds of years. And the, the old model was a manufacturer made a product. And it was really important for those manufacturers to get distribution. And distribution usually meant it had to be in front of customers' eyes. And that really meant that they needed to, a manufacturer really needed to partner with more retailers around the country to get those distributions. In other words, if you went to the local store, uh, you hope that as a manufacturer, you hope that your product was there. Um, and so that's why this kind of um, long-term partnership, if you will, of manufacturer selling to uh, a brick and mortar retailer and then selling it online has existed. Um, the problem with that is you're basically having a middleman um, uh, you know, in between the manufacturer and the customer. And so when the internet came along, it really has allowed brands to start to consider selling direct to their customers on, on Amazon and online. And that's why we've really seen a growth of all these direct to consumer brands. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about the Warby Parkers or the Caspers or uh, the Allbirds of the world where instead of using a retail um, you know, model where they uh, sell to brick and mortar retailers who then resell their products, they're selling direct. So the three models that really exist on Amazon, option one is vendor central, which is when you are a brand, you would sell your products to Amazon and then Amazon would sell it uh, to the end customer. Uh, the second model is what we call seller central through resellers. So this is when you as a brand sell it to resellers who then sell it on Amazon. And the third uh, model, um, which is what we'll talk a lot, a lot today is what we call direct to consumers. And this is where we kind of say, hey, think of Amazon as an extension of your website and you would create um, an Amazon storefront and an Amazon seller account with your name on it and you are selling direct to your customers. Um, so the advantages of the, the first two um, are really kind of uh, that it's simple and easy, right? And, and that most brands are used to it. Most brands are used to making products and selling it to retailers. And so going on one piece, similar model. You know, Amazon sends you a PO, you fulfill the PO, Amazon pays it for you. And that's the same for the most part on, 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 the, on the, the reseller model. Um, the disadvantages we'll talk about in detail going through here. Um, but uh, the, the main ones are that, hey, you're having a middleman in between you and the end customer, which means the middleman makes money off of you. Uh, th that means that you don't have control of your customers, you don't have control of your content, and you don't have control of your data. Um, and so what we'll talk about is that, hey, we think there's a big opportunity for a lot of brands to sell direct to customers on the Amazon platform, and you're gonna get control, you're gonna get increased margins, um, and you're gonna own your customer data. The disadvantages of um, selling direct to the customer is that it's really complex. You know, we, we like to think selling on Amazon is really easy, but it's actually pretty difficult. Um, and that's kind of where we come in and we exist as like an outsource partner. Um, so uh, next slide, Sean. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it over um, and let uh, the rest of the team take it from here. Awesome, yeah, thank you, Ethan. So yeah, just kind of double clicking again into Amazon Vendor Central. So as we talked about earlier, Amazon strategically tried to start limiting the number of vendors that they're, they're gonna have over the, the coming years, but Vendor Central is an invite only program, mainly for brands that do 5 million or above on the platform. And this is where you sell your product to Amazon at wholesale pricing. Amazon Amazon owns that product and resells it just like a traditional retailer would. So if you sell it a Dick's Sporting Goods or Walmart or Target, it functions very similarly to that. Um, obviously, if for, 
for brands that sell direct, when you're buying the product on the page, you see that it ships from and is sold by amazon.com. It lets you know that the product is, is kind of owned by Amazon in that 1P model. So this comes with some pros and some cons like Ethan talked about. I mean, the pros are it's pretty easy and simple. You negotiate with your vendor manager each year and Amazon sends large POs. The cons are you're selling at wholesale pricing, so you're leaving money on the table. Depending on what, what your brand's kind of price, wholesale pricing model is or list pricing model, you may be giving anywhere from 30 to 50 points of margin between wholesale and retail pricing. And you also usually have to pay additional fees to Amazon. So this is negotiated every year during your, your kind of vendor negotiations. There's the co-op fee, the freight and damage allowance fee, and kind of um, those can vary based on category and based on how aggressive the vendor manager is negotiating with you. Dan will kind of walk through later the P&L of what 1P versus 3P looks like. And then what we're seeing is we talk to a lot of our clients is Amazon just tries to squeeze vendors more and more each year and get more aggressive with those fees on top of the wholesale pricing that they're, they've been charging. The other thing that I know in my kind of life running brands and running the P&L and dealing with other um, retailers is Amazon's algorithm on one piece sets the price at whatever it thinks is the lowest price either on the platform or sometimes off the platform. And oftentimes that will set up a scenario where Amazon's the lowest price in the market. You have a map kind of minimum pricing or um, pricing that you don't want any brick and mortar retailer to go below. And Amazon will likely sell below that price, which can cause some pain with other retailers you sell to, whether in my day it was Walmart and Target would be unhappy with that, but everyone has a story around that. And it's, it's pretty tough to talk to anybody at Amazon. They'll just tell you that the, the algorithm sets the pricing. There's not much human intervention. The other thing that we're noticing, and it continues to kind of pick up um, and, and, and become more of a problem for brands, is that Amazon's be, been trying to recoup some of these pricing losses that they take via chargebacks um, that come in with your, your latest PO. And when we talk to a lot of companies, they're very hard to reconcile and very hard to dispute. So oftentimes you have a lot of these outstanding chargebacks that Amazon's trying to recoup and you're spending a ton of internal resources trying to reconcile where they're coming from and dispute those with Amazon. And oftentimes you're just submitting the dispute to kind of a computerized algorithm. The other thing, you don't always have full control over the customer experience. When Amazon's selling your product, they kind of have final say on the content. Like if you uploaded something, but they're on the listing, they could still overwrite it. And then just like a brick and mortar retailer, you're getting limited access to data um, and you're getting it on kind of a delayed basis. You're not seeing real time sales data on every product in ASIN that you're selling. And from what we find, Amazon really isn't willing to give any brand favored treatment. Everybody has to play by the same rules in this model. And Amazon's really fulfilling the demand of people coming to the, the platform. They're not creating it. So they're not trying to invest to grow your brand on your behalf. The next model is Amazon reseller model. So this is where you sell the product to either your distributors or a specific reseller partner at wholesale pricing, and you allow them to sell the product on Amazon. In this scenario, they give you a PO, buy the product from you, and then they list it and resell it on Amazon through their seller central account. So here you can kind of see when, when that scenario is, like this example is sold by Netrush, fulfilled by Amazon. So somebody's buying the product and then relisting it on the platform for this brand. Similar to the 1P model, it's easy and simple. They send you a, a monthly PO. The cons are you're still selling at wholesale pricing and leaving money on the table. And you don't own the, the consumer experience. This reseller or one of your distributors are um, because they own the seller account that's, that's owning the ASIN listing. And resellers tend to operate on very slim margins after paying to list on Amazon and, and fulfill by Amazon. So they oftentimes don't have a lot of margin or money to play with to invest in content development or advertising your brand to grow it. And if you have a scenario where you've let multiple resellers sell your products, this can lead to map issues is they're all trying to compete for the buy box and driving the price down, which in turn can also lead to channel conflicts if your pricing on Amazon is below where it is with some of you your other distributors or brick and mortar retailers. The other interesting stat is most consumers don't even realize that they're buying from a reseller. 
when they buy a product on Amazon, they just think they bought the product from Amazon and it's your brand. So if they have a bad experience, either a bad product, an expired product, a counterfeit product, it didn't arrive on time, it was damaged, they often go back and blame your brand and not the specific reseller because they're not thinking about it that way. And then we often find that a lot of resellers don't share a ton of data. So again, you're still getting limited access to your own consumer first party data in this model. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who's going to walk us through the seller central model and go through a, a P&L of 1P versus 3P. Thanks, John. So uh, as Sean and Ethan have highlighted, the selling direct on seller central model is just that you are operating through your own seller central account and you have the opportunity to sell direct to your customers. Um, your brand name is listed as the seller account of record. So there's not a small opportunity to build some brand equity there. You own the product until it sells, but most importantly, you have far more control over which products are sold and you have the opportunity to sell at full retail price. You go to the next slide here. So from a high level, the opportunity for selling direct to pros, you can treat your Amazon experience like your own brand's website. So you have control over your content story, messaging, customer service experience, uh, customer Q&A, uh, product review visibility, all of those things you can treat the same way that you would your own direct e-commerce business. Um, so similarly, control over the strategy, the pricing um, for your catalog, your content, and all the advertising is up to you. You own your own sales and customer data insights, which Sean is going to talk a little bit more in detail towards the end here. Um, and then also you have the opportunity for those increased profit margins because you don't have that retail middleman either as Amazon or a third party reseller in between you and your customer. On the con side, as Sean had previously mentioned, the biggest one here is that it needs, it requires a lot of work to execute efficiently. There's a lot of very specific skills and tasks that need to be uh, undertaken on a day-to-day -day basis to effectively run a direct seller central business. Uh, so you need to go out and either hire for that or find somebody that can provide that for you. And specifically, one of some of those things are around, you know, forecasting and shipping inventory into FBA centers. So on the next slide here, we wanted to walk you through kind of a component piece by piece breakdown um, of a sample product being sold via th these two business models and uh, sort of see uh, more clearly what makes up uh, your cost structure on both models and what the opportunity looks like. So here we're selling um, Sean's popular widget, uh, sample $50 product on Amazon. This could be a piece of clothing, it could be a personal care product, but it's a $50 widget. It's a pretty popular product. I hear that. So the first thing that's going to come out when you're working with through vendor central selling to Amazon is the wholesale discount at which you're buying there. They're buying your product. So we're modeling here a 40% wholesale discount um, for many product categories. We know that it can be significantly more than that. Um, but we're modeling here a 40% wholesale discount right off the bat. And what you're really getting for that is Amazon buying the product from you and taking on the responsibility of listing it and selling it to your customers. From there, um, Amazon deducts some additional fees. So depending on your specific vendor contract, co-op is one of the first things that comes out. And that is a, a percentage of your wholesale purchase orders that Amazon uses to promote your product. Um, unfortunately, as Sean mentioned, you don't get a lot of visibility of where this actually goes, um, specific keyword strategy or types of ads that they're running. Um, but this is a percentage and we see anywhere from, you know, five upwards to 15% 15 of wholesale purchase orders being used for this, uh, again, depending on your contract. Um, but that's another cost that'll come out. And then the last couple of pieces, usually one to 2%, um, depending on your agreement for freight, getting the product to Amazon's warehouse, and then um, a negotiated damage allowance for returns and damaged product and things of that nature. So for this sample product at the end of the day, um, with this sort of average cost structure, around $23 um, for a $50 uh, Sean's Popular widget sold through a vendor central model. And so on the right side here, we're gonna walk you through the same product sold through Seller Central. So again, we start with our $50 MSRP that you're, you are now selling that product direct to your customer for. 
And sort of the first couple of things you have to think about are sort of the cost of managing the business. So the first thing is, is Amazon's referral fee. This is a percentage of um, the sold cost that Amazon will deduct. It's the same for all sellers. It's slightly different for some product categories, but 15% is average for most things. So that'll come off the top and that's basically what you pay Amazon for selling a product through their platform. From there, um, and again, this kind of trying to tie things in on, and, and equate them, um, the cost of someone managing this business. So we're, at, we're um, modeling here a seven and a half percent management fee for someone to help support and manage this business and provide you all the expertise you need to do inventory forecasting and run your advertising campaigns and manage your content and things like that. Modeling in a similar ad spend uh, here, 5% of retail. Um, we always have to keep in mind when you're transitioning from vendor central to seller central that there is advertising activity going on for your brand and we need to keep that going. Um, and oftentimes brands want to increase that now that they have much more strategic control over it, but we're ad um, averaging in a 5% of retail advertising budget as well. And then the last couple of pieces, this is one area where the cost selling through Seller Central is a little bit higher because you have to factor in getting your product from your warehouse to Amazon and then from Amazon to that uh, end consumer. Uh, FBA um, using Amazon's fulfillment services is by far the most uh, cost effective and efficient way to do this for most brands. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next couple of slides. But this is a fee that you pay to Amazon to hold your product in their warehouse and then once sold, pick, pack, and ship it to the end consumer. It's uh, determined by the size, uh, the dimensions, and the weight of the individual product. But for this one, we're using just sort of an average uh, $6 FBA fee. Around 10% is usually fairly normal for most products. But again, varying a little bit depending on size and weight. And then finally, when you are selling direct through your own seller account, damages and returns do become your responsibility. Um, so different brands will have higher or lower costs associated with this, depending on the type of product and the category that they're in, but we're averaging that in. So at the end of the day, what you see here is, um, Sean, if you go one more, a net dollar amount for this particular product of uh, 28.15 versus $23 or a 22% increase um, for this particular product. And if you go onto the next slide, you can see that, you know, 22%, a few dollars more per product may not seem like a lot, but when you uh, extrapolate that out to uh, say a $3 million business, uh, if that's the volume of your products that are being sold through the platform, um, the increase could be as much as you know, $300,000 for a, for a business of that size going through this platform. And so one more slide here to kind of um, put this side by side, which model is best for your brand. And this speaks to some of those different feeds and the different types of products um, that we were discussing in the breakdown there. But better products um, or products that might be better fit for vendor central, things with lower retail prices under $15 where those fulfillment and shipping fees um, end up being too costly to make sense. Uh, if you have a catalog of products where you don't necessarily have a map price or channel conflict with other uh, other channels isn't a concern. If you have uh, relatively large or, or bulky or heavy products where again shipping becomes a challenge, Vendor Central could potentially be a better fit. Or if you have a product like um, say Tide where it doesn't require a lot of robust content or uh, messaging experience to sell, something that consumers are going to come through and they're really just looking for a good deal or the best price and you don't really need to sell it. If customer data is not particularly important for your business structure and strategy, if Amazon is a small part of your sales, or if you sell through a lot of distributors, so your supply chain is a little bit more difficult to sort of control and, and get your hands around, those might be situations where Vendor Central could be a better fit. But for the vast majority of brands that we talk to, Seller Central is interesting if, again, you have products that are priced over $15, where that pricing stability is important for you, for your other channels. Um, lighter or sort of medium weight products that aren't overly expensive to ship. If you have a desire to control your brand image and the customer experience, if that sales data could be valuable to you uh, to influence, uh, to inform your other uh, e-commerce channels and strategies. If Amazon is a significant part of your overall business sales and you have a clean, clean supply chain or any combination of those things, Seller Central could be the model for you. Awesome, thank you, Dan. Yep. No, no, we've had a, a few questions rolling in. We'll, we'll kind of take all the questions in probably about five minutes and, and start rolling through them at the end just to hold 
hold to the end of the presentation. So I'll kind of jump in and talk, kind of reiterate our worldview, which we think for many brands and kind of setting yourself up for what we'll call like the e-commerce decade, where e-commerce is going to continue to grow and many brick and mortar retailers will continue to shrink or reduce their footprint. Um, we think that having a seller central model, which gives your brand control and gives you access to, to kind of first party consumer data is the way to go and how we can do about it. So when you sell seller central, I think Ethan always says it best. You can really take control on Amazon and treat it like an extension of your own direct to, to consumer website strategy. Um, and, and make sure that that experience feels very similar to your website strategy, because that's where consumers are shopping and where they, they prefer to shop because they have a prime membership and they've kind of been enticed and incented to behave that way. So the three big things that we always think about, and we reiterated them a little bit earlier is why sell on seller central one is increase your net revenue or your profit margin because you're removing that middleman like Dan showed you in the, the P&L, you're, you're not giving up your wholesale to retail margin. You can capture your full margin just like you would on your own direct to consumer website. And then controlling your entire brand experience end to end. So you can set your pricing so that it's not being violated by the algorithm. You can start to determine who sells your products with the right agreements with your vendors, start cleaning up and removing any unauthorized sellers. And then you own your content experience end to end to make it as as robust as you can um, to capture and convert new consumers to your brand. And the thing that gets us really excited is you get to own your own data. So you can get name and address of all your customers, what they ordered. Um, you can get real-time data by ASIN to, to better forecast, to understand what's working, what's not on Amazon as you're changing content. So really that data experience on, on Seller Central is unmatched and can really set you up to drive insights for growth, both on and off Amazon. The other things we think Seller Central kind of help you do is protect your brand, which means you can start putting the right agreements in place, which with your, your vendors saying that you're the only one allowed to sell on Amazon. So you can start winning hundred percent of the buy box. You can get full MSRP for your product and start making higher margins. You can start enhancing your content so it does look and perform the way that your website does. Amazon's done a great job by rolling out brand registry where you can register your trademarks. You can create your own brand storefront that can mimic the navigation of your website and add plus content that like below the fold content you probably have on your own product pages on your own website um, to really make it a robust experience. And then once you're kind of controlling everything end to end, we see the potential to amplify with your advertising to acquire new customers profitably and kind of grow your brand and bring new consumers into the fold is, is huge when you're winning the buy box and your content is really representing and showing your brand in a, in a way that, that feels like your website and feels like your brand story. And then this also helps you while it's a little bit more work and partners like us can help you can forecast more accurately because you're not waiting for Amazon to send a PO where Amazon may go out of stock on a product for a little while. You can avoid that by kind of tightly managing what products you're selling and how many days on hand you have. We tend to recommend anywhere between like 30 and 60 days so that you're avoiding long-term storage fees, but you can get real-time data to better forecast to make sure that you're not out of stock or that you don't have a ton of products sitting there that's not going to sell through. In the the database, which we think is extremely exciting, is we think brands that understand their consumer data, specifically first party data, are going to win the next e-com decade. I think it, Ethan talked about it best. Brands like Casper or Warby Parker or brands like Bonobos that really control their direct-to-consumer experience understand everything about their consumer from their, their small retail footprint to their direct-to-consumer websites. We believe you can start to do that with some of your Amazon data, especially when you enrich it with your own website's data. So some of the benefits of selling Dollar Central is you get consumer data, so name, address, and order data. You get product level sales and conversion data, inventory data, things to, to help you make better business decisions and, and, and see if the things you're, you're doing are working and, and testing. And then you also get access to demographic and behavioral data. Um, to better understand your shoppers, what they're buying, how they're converting, what products of yours they're purchasing together, um, and what they were looking at. The other thing that this can allow you to do, and this is something that we offer to, to all of our clients, is you can start to build cross-channel e-com insights. So if you 
if you run your D2C website on a Shopify, a big commerce, a Magento, a WooCommerce, you can start to take that data through APIs and then take your Amazon Seller Central data through APIs and really build a full profile on your customer based on first name, last name, and zip code and what they ordered to start seeing like, what's the lifetime value of your customer across all channels? Did they buy on your website once, twice, and then shift over to Amazon for the rest of the, that kind of customer relationship or vice versa? So we do that for a lot of our clients. We, we create custom dashboards where you can start to see the overlap between your D2C website and Shopify, who's buying on both, where did you acquire those customers first, what's the average or size of your product by channel, so that you can start making better decisions about your CRM programs on your website, how you're investing in Facebook and Instagram ads, where you should be driving those to, and what kind of cannibalization there is across your businesses to really give you a true understanding of how your consumer behaves online. So with that, we are at the end of the presentation and we have some Q and A that have come in. So I'll start going through those and we'll get your questions answered here. First question is, will the full slide deck follow? Absolutely, we'll get it sent out by the end of the day to everybody who attended so that you can save it, you can share it with others at your company, share it with your friends. Um, one question is, and I don't know if we have this stat or Ethan, if you've seen anything on it, but store closures are one metric, but do we have any data on store openings? Um, or are there any statistics around that? I believe from my understanding of just like reading some of the basic stuff that's going on that more stores are closing than are, than are yeah, open. I can take that really quick. So if you look, um, it, this is going back to one of the early slides about the number of store closing. So um, if you look at, if we just take 2019 as an example, there were roughly 10,000 retail stores that were closed in 2019 and approximately 5,000 were open. So there's kind of a two to one ratio of um, twice as many stores being closed um, as uh, they're being open. I think if we transform, uh, move that forward to, to, uh, to this year, um, you know, right now there's somewhere in the order of 600,000 stores that are closed, mostly because of COVID. And the question sort of is as well, of those 600,000, how many are not going to open up? Um, so if you look at last year and just say, hey, 10,000 um, closes, closures uh, plus 5,000 starts was a net 5,000 um, closures. I mean, this year with 600,000 stores being closed, you know, I'm just throwing out numbers, but maybe 50,000 to 100,000 of those never reopen. Um, you know, we're talking about bankruptcies already from JC Penney's, Neiman Marcus, Lord and Taylor, um, True Religion. Um, you know, it's, it's not unreasonable to think that 50 to 100,000 stores don't reopen. Um, which is give or take maybe 10% of all stores outstanding. I'm just throwing out numbers. I don't know um, the details, but the point being is that um, as more and more retail stores close, uh, we think it's driving more and more traffic online. And that's just, uh, you know, online is only 15 to 20% of total dollars. Um, you know, the, the, this could easily go to from 15% to 20, 30, 40, 50% in the next couple of years here. And my sense is that COVID probably pushes forward this, uh, the shift to online by, you know, probably three to five years faster than it would have uh, normally. Great. Great. Next question is, what's the best way to deal with 3P vendors who are undercutting pricing and causing Amazon to lose the buy box? So I guess if you're on Vendor Central and Amazon selling the product there, and there's also 3P vendors that are trying to undercut Amazon. Um, yeah. Ethan, again, do you have any kind of best practice approaches to cleaning up unauthorized sellers you could share? Yeah, so um, obviously unauthorized sellers are a big problem on Amazon. Um, and, and usually unauthorized sellers come from, uh, you know, brands and um, not having a clean supply chain and to, or a big gray market. Um, and so I think there's the, a two prong approach that we always work with brands on. The first is understanding how you can use uh, the Amazon messaging system and the Amazon IP infringement system to turn in unauthorized sellers. And so um, ourselves, but many other companies out there 
um, have developed software that will scan listings on a daily basis to find who is uh, selling your products on Amazon um, and then compare it to a white list of if they're authorized or not. If they're not authorized, uh, what we usually would do is a two-prong approach. One is we would start using a messaging system through Amazon, reaching out to the brand, uh, the seller and saying, hey, we noticed that you're selling on Amazon. We don't know who you are. Um, as you can imagine, we care deeply about um, our price being um, authentic. You're not on our authorized seller list. Um, can you please send us uh, invoices proving that you're selling authorized product? Um, if they don't come back with you know, uh, invoices showing us authorized product, we then turn them in to Amazon through Amazon brand registry for um, IP, uh, intellectual property claims, and usually Amazon will take them down um, for those. Um, if they do send us invoices, then we know how they're getting the gray market product. Um, the second thing we, we work with, um, or, or what you should do to help track these people down, um, look at uh, what vendors that you're currently selling to, um, and knowing that the people that are selling this product on Amazon are probably getting it from you, um, unless, unless they're counterfeit. But if they're getting it from you, you can, I can, you can usually start looking and going, hey, these people are selling these products on Amazon, um, and not these. What vendors are buying a whole bunch of those products? Because obviously the person who's winning the buy box on Amazon is selling a huge amount of product. Um, and so what vendors that are you currently selling to look suspicious that they're buying way more than you think they should be or that you've seen them, oh, this is our fastest growing vendor and I don't know anything about them. Those are kind of the two approaches that we usually work with um, brand partners with to track down those anomalies. Great. Thanks, Ethan. And then uh, another question is, can we do, can you do a strategy where you have both? So have a vendor central account, but also have a seller central account. Dan, you want to take that one? Sure, I can take that one. So um, the short answer is uh, it depends. Um, I think for most vendor agreements, there is a stipulation that prohibits brands from selling the same products, both to Vendor Central and through Seller Central. Um, so most brands find it um, difficult to sort of maintain a balance selling some products to Amazon and some through Seller Central. And at the end of the day, you're, you're still going to find yourself in a situation where you have um, limited control over what's happening with a certain batch of products um, and uh, much better control over other, other pro products. So some, some brands do do it, but from an overall strategic standpoint, we generally don't recommend it because for most brands, all the things that we stated, profitability, access to data, access to control is superior on the seller central side. So, <clears throat> excuse me, technically in some situations you can, um, but the simplest answer is not with the same products at the same time, both on seller and vendor central. Great. Next question I have is, if we have multiple brands and want to sell on seller central, should we create a seller central account for each brand or one account for all three brands? Our overall parent company isn't well known like the brands are, and could that hurt our sales if they're not listed under each brand as the seller. Yeah, I can take that one. This is Ethan. In, you know, in general, um, if you have a well-known brand, we recommend that you would create a, an, a, an additional seller central account for each of those. Um, you know, if you look at the statistics, customers like to buy products from the manufacturer. Um, so in other words, you know, if I'm buying a Sony television on Amazon, I'd have a lot more confidence buying it from Sony than I would from some random seller name. And so, uh, that uh, that reinforces it and it's actually been proven to increase sales. So we do recommend uh, that each brand name would have its own seller central account. I mean, there are a couple stipulations around there that, um, you know, if they're pretty small brands, um, I probably wouldn't recommend it. But, you know, if, if you're a brand selling over say a million dollars a year or something on Amazon, I would highly recommend doing it that way. The only stipulations are that um, you would have to have a separate EIN number um, for each of the different brands. Great, thank you, Ethan. Um, another question around, someone's currently selling about a million dollars through several resellers selling on Amazon. If they were to set up their own seller central account and jump on those listings, would, would you see a drop in sales initially? Um, Dan or Ethan, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. And so I think there's two things to think about when you're kind of making a switch to seller central or selling yourself directly. 
Um, the first is that, I mean, if taking a step back, Amazon's going to sell a thousand units of the product um, if it's on Vendor Central, if it's through three party, 3P retailers or through yourself directly. So the demand for your product is roughly going to be the same um, for all three models. Um, however, kind of the implementation will change a little bit. So for instance, um, if you are going to go and start selling on Seller Central for the first time and you are currently using partners who are doing it, you have to remember that those partners are going to have inventory that is there. So it, it, there's inventory in the channel, if you will. And so what will usually happen is what we would recommend is you would, you can either try to buy back that inventory from them um, to quickly get your sales up. Or what I would do usually is you would create and start selling your, uh, um, you know, if there's, let's say there's five authorized sellers, you would now be the sixth authorized seller. You would start be, you know, start selling those product direct. And what you would do is have a kind of a six month or so time frame where you slowly stop selling products to these authorized people um, as they clear out the inventory. Because otherwise, like you, you, you are correct that like, a if you immediately switched from letting these vendors sell to immediately selling it yourself, they may have one month or two months of inventory um, that would need to be cleared before you, um, you know, really started picking up your sales. So we, 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 we think that there's a good phased approach. You do it over time in many cases. Um, to avoid that kind of cash crunch that you may have. Great. Ethan, I have one, one more question that I want to send your way around kind of tax, tax nexus. So in our opinion, do we expect all 50 states to require Amazon to be the tax facilit facilitator? Currently, we can't sell on Seller Central because we'd have a nexus in those few remaining states that would require us to file taxes instead of Amazon. Any thoughts there? Yeah, so if we take a step back, um, you know, if you sell, uh, so let me take, uh, sorry, uh, about two years ago, there was a, a, a case called the Wayfair case um, that really changed the way sales tax works. Um, and so historically, if you had um, sold on Amazon and Seller Central, you would have to file and remit sales tax um, to all the states that Amazon had uh, uh, warehouses in, which was the vast majority of them. Um, currently, that's, that, that's being uh, the way that the system is, that works is being changed where Amazon will collect and remit sales tax on your behalf. Um, it, to be honest with you, yes, I think very soon all 50 states will require sales tax. I mean, I think we're currently 35 of the 50 states are automatically doing the Amazon um, sales tax remittance up from almost zero a year ago. Um, and so I think that the 15 remaining are the ones that are going to... Um, uh, we'll do it shortly. I will say, I think there's five or five to 10 states in the United States, such as like um, uh, Florida or such that uh, don't have sales tax. So net net, yes, um, you know, all states will be doing collecting and remitting sales tax. The one thing I would say is, you know, most brands, if you have a website um, uh, that you're selling direct to consumers on your own website, um, Amazon is exactly the same as that. And so, um, uh, you know, selling on Seller Central um, has the exact same requirements as if you were having your own website selling direct to your consumers. We don't think it's an additional burden as long as you were selling on your website as well. Great, one, one question, Dan, this might be one that you could, you could take here is, if you're above kind of the 5 million in sales number and you're on Vendor Central today, what, what, a, how, what would you start thinking about if you were to kind of separate from them and start going the Seller Central route? For everybody here in the in the slides that I'll send out, I have some detailed slides on what that transition process could look like. We didn't want to go in nitty gritty detail on with it today, but you will get those. But Dan, any high level thoughts on how you could start thinking about that transition or things to think about? Yeah, sure. So if you're in a situation where where you have a, a you know a substantial steady business through Vendor Central. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, all of the opportunities that we outlined here today don't apply to you, you know, um, the additional margin opportunity, better control, um, better strategic sort of grip on the channel. Um, but you do have the opportunity to make a transition um, under sort of your timeline and as you choose in a strategic way, rather than um, a number of the brands that we've heard about in the last year who have sort of been forced to make the transition suddenly because they didn't get their purchase order um, on Monday morning as they expected or something like that. So the first thing that I would start to think about is, you know, understanding um, what level of remaining inventory and, and sort of what that position is um, with your current vendor central account. 
um, what sort of uh, natural cycles in your business are upcoming that might um, provide an opportune time to make a transition. If you have a new season of product lines or a new, new set of products launched, those um, sort of, again, natural cycles in your, in your business might be an opportune time to think about making that transition. Um, and from there, it's just really about planning. And as Sean mentioned, there are some additional slides at the end of this deck that'll kind of walk you through a bunch of the high level things that you should think about. But it's, it's a fairly straightforward process of strategically, you know, setting up a new account and then over time, discontinuing products for fulfillment through Amazon as you list and start to sell them uh, at the same time uh, through your seller central account. So um, you can do it in a strategic manner. There's a number of things to think about that are detailed in those additional slides, but those are some of the high level things that I would, I would think about um, if you're considering transitioning on your own schedule versus uh, being forced to do so. Great. One other question that we got is, is around, um, as a direct 3P reseller, rather than, than 1P, do you lose any marketing tools that you would maybe get on 1P that you wouldn't have access to on 3P? Yeah, this is Ethan. I think the um, overall answer to that is not really no. Um, you know, Amazon has been talked about how they're basically going to be merging like the back end systems for, of 1P and 3P together. So all the marketing tools will be exactly the same across the two. Um, but right now, um, if anything, you get more information um, and data on the 3P side because you get all the customer information. Great. And that kind of dovetails. Another question is, are you able to advertise with AMS and Seller Central? Absolutely. Yeah. And then one, one, one other question that we have here is, or is around, if you're outside of the United States, so say in the UK, do you have to be in that United States business to set up a United States Seller Central account? Uh, you, you do not. You can sell it, set it up. Um, you know, we have a lot of partners that are um, mostly European companies um, that want to sell uh, into the United States through Amazon. And um, you know, we've, we've worked with quite a few of those in the past, so that's not an issue. Great. There's a question here about um, how we connect Amazon data to um, uh, your Shopify or other platforms. I, I can talk a little bit about that, but um, if we take a step back, uh, for most businesses and brands, um, uh, Amazon is give or take 50% of online commerce. The second big portion for most brands is their website. And on average, their website's about 30% of uh, total sales uh, online. So if you add your Amazon data, um, our systems connect with Shopify and other platforms like Magento and BigCommerce. Um, we can basically combine your Shopify and your Amazon data. And now you have a picture of who 80% of your total customers are. Um, and that is, you know, down to the customer order um, level detail. And so uh, you're going to get um, name and address. Um, you're also going to get what they've purchased and you're getting that real time. And so by getting 80% of your DTC business data, you can really start gaining insights around that. Um, I think the first one that you're getting is, hey, you know what's selling real time. And so, um, you know, we were talking with a, a maker of nursing scrubs recently and with the, the pandemic, you know, sales on Amazon for nursing scrubs have gone up a whole bunch. Um, but they didn't even really realize that because they didn't know what their retail partners were selling. Um, whereas if you were selling direct, you would know. And so um, because of that, the, the brands are getting to know what, what's actually selling at real time. And so they can start making um, adjustments on the production schedule of, hey, this one's selling a whole bunch, let's make more. This one's um, not selling very much, let's sell less. So that's one thing. The second thing we can do um, by combining those insights is kind of look, hey, um, where are your customers coming from? Are, are most of your customers actually buying products on Amazon? Are they buying it on your Shopify website? Um, what's the lifetime value of all those customers? Um, do the people on Amazon buy from you more often um, than the ones on your website um, or not? Um, are they starting on Amazon and then going to your website? Are they starting on your website and then going to Amazon? Um, you know, where are they located? Um, so you can know what states um, most of your purchases are coming from. And based on that, you can do marketing plans around um, advertising to those people, um, you know, maybe micro-targeting using lookalike audiences on Facebook and stuff like that. Um, so there's a whole bunch of um, data insights. But the whole, being here, the whole thing being here is that if you can combine your, your website data with your Amazon data, you're getting 80%, give or take, of your total direct-to-consumer business or online business, um, which is the vast majority. And basically, you can... Um, you make the big decisions off of it.
Yeah, for a couple of the accounts that we we have this this data capability hooked up to, I think one of the questions is always around like overlap and cannibalization. What we've actually found, um, which I think is a big fear, is if you sell on Amazon, are you just going to shift your entire B two C site customers over to Amazon? We actually found that Amazon was just by the sheer size of it being fifty percent of e commerce is a customer acquisition channel. So by being there, the brand was bringing in a lot more new trialists to the brand and new customers. Um, through that channel than, than they were just when they were just selling D2, D2C alone. So it really gives you some fascinating data to kind of help you make better decisions and view the channels differently. Yeah. Great. Um, awesome. I think we are pretty close to time here. So um, one, one plug here, if you guys have follow-up questions um, with the email that will go out today. I'll have my contact information here. Our team of kind of strategists led by myself and Dan would love to set up time with you and answer any specific questions that you have. Um, otherwise, you could also fill out a form on our website and it gets dumped directly to me so I can can make sure that we, we answer any follow-up questions that you have. But the deck will be sent out. We'll send out a recording and post it on YouTube so that you can share this with anybody um, in your company or in your network. And we look forward to continuing the conversation and don't hesitate to reach out and set up time. We'd, we'd love to talk through any questions um, you have about your Amazon business or your Amazon strategy. Yeah, I think, and thanks everybody for the time. We're happy to help again. I apologize, there are over 40 questions so we couldn't get through all of them, but um, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to Sean or myself um, for any follow-ups. Okay, thank you guys, appreciate it. Take care. Thanks everybody. Bye.